Osama Wait, bin Laden. Is it good? Yeah, uh, where's, good? Where's Osama bin Laden? Oh, you're getting to a bad place, my friend. Our show obviously is at a disadvantage compared to the many other news sources that we are competing with. For one thing, we uh, are fake. The news. We all hate it. Here's like actual customer out here. Uh, what's uh, what's the best kind of firework to buy? Wouldn't you like to know, weather boy? For decades, Americans have been able to rely on their favorite Botox-faced correspondents to deliver hard-hitting coverage of the pertinent issues plaguing this great nation of ours with tremendous poise and integrity. It's a cloud deck out there now that hopefully we can get- Oh! The news may be rooted in humble beginnings, but in America, the meaning of journalism has been watered down to mean nothing more than sensationalist, clickbaity garbage that thrives on ignorance and hinges on the assumed laziness of the the average consumer. Reactionary headlines and hit pieces are certainly not hard to come by, as every story nowadays is framed to appeal to our inane prejudice and personal bias. Just about every major news network is living proof that facts don't matter near as much as pushing an agenda. If only we had someone to hold these so-called journalists accountable for the hypocrisy and blatant lies peddled throughout the mainstream. And well, that's what made Jon Stewart so special. Uh, describe the scene for us earlier. It, uh, earlier, it's actually happening as we speak. <laughs> Parade's happening right now. Perhaps you can tell by the fact that nobody can see me. You put the reporter in front of the crowd. <laughs> MSNBC, show them how it's done. Let's head there now. We've got MSNBC's Ned Reznikoff, who's standing by. <laughs> Jesus! You may not remember Jon Stewart very well, especially if you're my age or even younger, but his impact on politics and journalism is one that still resonates in our culture to this very day. Jon Stewart revolutionized the way we get our news when he took over as host of The Daily Show on Comedy Central all the way back in 1998. The show describes itself as more or less of a news parody, drawing its satirical edge from recent stories, political figures, and just about any major issue that might be making headlines. Lines. If it's getting coverage, The Daily Show will probably make fun of it. If you're looking to run for president, maybe you shouldn't make your response to the State of the Union look like a ransom video. <laughs> Under the reign of Trevor Noah now, the show remains at the top of Comedy Central's ratings and has accumulated a whopping total of 24 Emmy Awards in the 23 years it's been on the air. But there's no question John's contributions to the show made it what it is today by influencing the political landscape in a way that no one could have seen coming. Before John became host, The Daily Show followed a far more conventional format. Hosted by former ESPN anchor Craig Kilborn, the show rarely featured any guests of value value or depth. The actors and musicians showcased were arguably superficial compared to the career politicians and lawmakers John would rather interview. Once Kilborn left to host The Late Late Show in 1998, John was the perfect replacement, because not only did he have the comedic skills and timing necessary to entertain an audience, but his political knowledge and sheer fascination for journalism would allow the show to become different and smarter than it ever had been. But even with that in mind, I don't think anyone could have expected it to be the political lightning rod it soon became. In just these past few weeks, I have disemboweled, I have mauled, I have hammered, I have destroyed, I bitch stopped. Jon Stewart arrived on the scene at the perfect time. The 2000 election between Al Gore and George W. Bush provided more than enough comedic material for a late night show fueled by left-wing satire. I was not elected to serve one party. You were not elected. <laughs> John and his fake correspondents had a field day making fun of the ridiculous nature of that election. With ratings soaring by the week, the show was given more authority than ever and had more sway in the political scene, which meant more people began to listen to what John had to say. John actually had an advantage compared to other late night hosts. One of the major appeals to the show was the fact that he wasn't a journalist. Despite holding valuable opinions and sharing educated takes with his massive audience, at the end of it all, he was just another late 
late night comic. A title which allowed him to critique real life issues and politicians from the safety of his fake newsman persona. I'm a, 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 a tiny neurotic man standing in the back of the room throwing tomatoes at the chalkboard and that's really it. But that doesn't mean his words didn't hold gravitas. In fact, it was just the opposite. Over the 16 years he was on the air, John made his position on mainstream news coverage more than clear, spitting in the face of the 24-hour news cycle regularly and denouncing the hyperbolic rhetoric he saw being peddled on both sides of the aisle. Unlike many today, John didn't agree with the over-dramatization exhibited by more and more figures in the media. He recognized that in the absence of chaos, the news was forced to conjure their own, an idea that he vehemently opposed and targeted. 24-hour news networks are built for one thing, and that's 9-11. In the absence of that, they're not just going to say there's not that much that's urgent or important or conflicted happening today. So we are going to gin up. We are going to uh, bring forth more conflict and more sensationalism because we want you to continue watching us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even when the news doesn't necessarily warrant that type of behavior. A classic example would be his disdain for a program that used to air on CNN called Crossfire, hosted by Tucker Carlson and a doorknob with hair. And I say used to because after John came on as a guest, the show was f***ing cancelled. And I think if you watch these clips, you'll see why. I made a special effort to come on the show today because I have uh, privately amongst my friends and also in occasional newspapers and television shows <laughs> mentioned uh, this show as being uh, uh, bad. <laughs> Your partisan, um, what do you call it, hacks. Okay. You have a responsibility to the public discourse. And you, you fail job a miserably. Now, this is theater. I mean, it's, it's it is, obvious. No, no, it is. How old are you? 35. And you wear a bow tie. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. So, I do. so this is... No, no, I know, I know. So when you have people on for just knee-jerk, reactionary talk. Wait, I thought you were gonna be funny. Come on, be funny. No, no, I'm not gonna be your monkey. During this painfully tense interview, John raises an interesting point. That without shows like Crossfire doing their bona fide political theater every night, nobody would bother tuning in. That's because our culture has now become so used to overhyped headlines and dramatic exaggerations that we give this type of coverage a pass when we really shouldn't. John's point here is that although these journalists should be regarded as an integral part of a legitimate news business, Business, they're letting the American people down by exchanging facts and integrity for easy ratings, a sentiment that still rings true in just about every single news program on the air today. In the absence of controversy, the news must create their own in order to stay afloat, and that in itself is a problem that John sought to expose. OJ's not going to kill someone every day, so that's gone. So what do you have to do? You have to elevate the passion of everything else that happens that might even be somewhat mundane and elevate it to the extent that this is breaking news. This is developing news. This is breaking developing news. John's war against sensationalism didn't stop at Crossfire, though. In 2008, he set his sights at another prominent figure at the time, Jim Cramer of CNBC, who runs a show called Mad Money, which gives you financial advice from the words of a coked-up Louis C.K. He has no idea how bad it is out there. He has no idea. He has no idea. Kramer. I have talked to the heads of almost every single one of these firms in the last 72 hours and he has no idea what it's like out there. None! John famously lambasted the network for their poor coverage of the 2008 financial crisis that left the country in shambles. Kramer knew he was lying to his audience at the time, as it was his faulty advice that led to thousands of Americans to make questionable decisions with their money in the midst of such a major economic crisis. John restored the jurisdiction that should have been there in the first place and exposed the facade of Kramer's show, as well as others that rely on fake reactionary language to peddle a harmful narrative. You know... I mean, I, I gotta tell you, it, you know, I understand you want to make finance entertaining, but it's not a game. And I, 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 when I watch that, I get... I can't tell you how angry that makes me. John was actually holding him accountable for his mistakes, which is more than most journalists are prepared to do these days. The bias of the mainstream media is towards sensationalism, conflict, and laziness. The embarrassment is that I'm given credibility in this world because of the disappointment that the public has 
in what the news media does. I don't think not because I, don't I think, have an I don't ideological think, I don't agenda. Think you know it's bad when a comedian has more integrity than a professional newsman. But nothing in late night today quite compares to the famous rivalry between John Stewart and Bill O'Reilly. John and Bill, being on completely separate ends of the political spectrum, quarreled just about every chance they got. Not just taking shots at one another from the comfort of their own news desks, but also through each other's programs as guests. Before before we get started, I have to take issue with something you said early in the program. Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, you are better looking now than you were three years ago. Yeah. I, I can assure you that that is not the case. Is that, yeah, <laughs> that coming from a man you who doesn't are, shave in the morning? Let me tell you something. I honestly, I walked in here, they said you're doing O'Reilly. I go, are, are you sure I'm not at the Crypt Keeper's house? Uh huh. Even having a full on debate in Washington, D.C. ahead of the 2012 election, talking about all sorts of issues that were important at the time and even some that are prevalent now. They didn't exactly change the minds of their audience, but they did manage to set an example of what a proper debate should look like. They attacked each other's positions rather than their personalities, and pushed the boundaries of political discourse all while being entertaining at the same time. Which is not an easy gig, Stewart has no issue standing up for what he believes in, no matter what the cost may be. Which meant there wasn't always a punchline. I honestly have, have nothing uh, other than just sadness, once again, that we have to peer into the abyss of the depraved violence that we do to each other and the nexus of a just gaping racial wound that will not heal yet we pretend doesn't exist. The way comedians deal with calamities is usually very telling of their character. Johnny Carson, Conan O'Brien, David Letterman were all burdened with the task of handling tragedies. And it goes without saying that John's character was on full display after the attacks on 9-11, when he delivered a monologue that was different than anything we were used to. I'm, there's no other way really to start the show than, than to ask uh, you at home the question that, that we asked the audience here tonight and that we've asked uh, everybody that we know here in New York uh, since uh, uh, September 11th, and that is, are you okay? He didn't try to crack any jokes or put up some facade of false bravery. Instead, he spoke from the heart, and the result became one of the most moving moments in the show's history. The view from my apartment was the World Trade Center. And now it's gone. And they attacked it. This symbol of American ingenuity and strength and, and labor and imagination and commerce. And it is gone. But you know what the view is now? The Statue of Liberty. John somehow managed to find the words necessary to encapsulate the feeling radiating in America at that time. It was moving in the sense that the audience could feel his authenticity, giving people a much needed sense of comfort and reassurance. In that moment, it was as if he was speaking for an entire nation. The view from the south of Manhattan is now the Statue of Liberty. You can't beat that. John effectively warped the fundamental idea of what a late night talk show should look like. The Daily Show not only sparked the careers of today's A-list comedians like Stephen Colbert, John Oliver, Ed Helms, Steve Carell, but it also served as a blueprint of what a satire program should resemble. The success of Jon Stewart's show came from the fact that the right-wing media was not being held accountable for the overhyped misinformation being spread. So John's show served as a counterweight, whereas today we actually see more and more late night shows resembling the very concept John set out to mock. Sensationalist stories and political pandering basically dominate the late night jimmies of today, which contrasts heavily to John and how he cared more about upholding truth and honesty. Rather than creating his own drama, he would simply mock the issues of the day and make his voice heard. He didn't pander and he didn't care so much about painting one side as the definite bad guys. Instead, he valued authenticity and integrity, which matters more than anything at the end of the day. The media in general, you said it yourself. It is, it's focused on conflict. It's focused on creating drama and a false sense of urgency. For better or for worse, the 24-hour networks 
are now the leading light of our information age. John Stewart was unlike anything we had ever seen before. It was his biting satire and clever social commentary that made The Daily Show ahead of its time. It was valued as more than just another late night time slot. Instead of making fun of the news, it became a news show in itself. After any major event, people would tune in just to hear John's take on it. His voice was powerful enough to be valued by Democrats and Republicans alike. Viewers young and old, not just college kids in a dorm, but also middle-aged journalists with prolific knowledge and insight into the issues he was covering. His show not only had the reporting of the news, it had jokes, interviews, skits, and of course, John's valuable commentary tying it all together. It's clear to me that John is more than just a typical comedian. He was the voice of a nation that somehow managed to entertain and educate millions in a way that no other late night host has or ever will achieve. And you know, he was a hell of a lot better than this. Can you open this <laughs> jar of pickles? This has not been tampered with. This is... <laughs> oh, oh, you get it. Keep on, keep on.